Now, from high atop his desk, get ready to peel it all back and get to the root of the subject. No pun intended. With Paul K on Wine Talks, where he takes no prisoners and calls it the way he sees it. Welcome to Wine Talks with Paul K, and we are just so excited today to have the continuing series of The Judgment of Paris. You can find Wine Talks on Spotify, Google Play, Apple Play, uh, iTunes, and your favorite podcast hangouts, and always sponsored by the original Wine of the Month Club, now sporting the Bordeaux series, Napa series, and the Sweet Wine series. This, uh, and we're, we're, I'm excited, I just, I'm not sure where to start, but I just want to introduce Violet Gergich, and she is the daughter of the famed Mike Gergich, who, who was responsible for the wine that beat the Burgundies in the Judgment of Paris, and I just wanted to touch on that, what the Judgment of Paris was, in case some of the listeners don't know. Um, this is a tasting that occurred in 1976, it was not meant to be much, but it pitted the French Burgundies, the white Burgundies, Chardonnay versus four or five California Chardonnays, and it pitted California Cabernets against the French Bordeaux. And it wasn't meant to be much. We won. It's probably the only book you'll ever read where you know the ending, but it's a fabulous story. And part of that story is the Gergich family. And I have here today, Violet Gergich. Uh, welcome to the show. This is, this is going to be so much fun. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. And I see in the back, we have a cutout, which I ha still say, it looks like you stand there looking out the window. It's mm -hmm. your father. It absolutely is. Uh, it's not a recent one. I think it was taken when he was in his 60s or 70s. But it's a great picture of him actually standing in his Yonfo vineyard surrounded by mustard. And uh, we made a standee just for fun. It was for an auction lot and then brought it back to our tasting room. And it was so popular, it was stolen. So then we actually no. <laughs> had to make some more. Stolen, and now it's in the living room in Napa. And, uh, you know, he's wearing his famed uh, monikered, uh, was it a fisherman's hat? It's a, it's a French beret, actually. French My beret. daughter was like, yeah, how, how did he know when he was in college, you know, studying, when he bought the beret? He actually bought the beret uh, because he lost his umbrella. He left it on a tram going to university and he couldn't afford an umbrella. So he happened to see this French beret in a window shop and thought, well, not only will it keep my head covered, but I can put it in my pocket so I don't lose it. And uh, years later, he's like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I'm wearing a French beret. And then I beat the French in 76. And so you just, it's a lovely coincidence. That, it all ties together and it became it sort of his... Uh, mm -hmm moniker for the industry well let's go do let's do that because uh my family uh is they're all immigrants my grandfather's immigrant my mom well my mom's born in chicago i guess that's not an immigrant but uh, my my father came from cairo in 1949 and mm -hmm. your father was croatian mm -hmm. right. th this is the part that fascinated me about the part in the book about your father's history and how he got here just tell me as a child what he was doing and then how he ended up deciding to go to the University for Enology and how that trek started. So he was born in a small poor village in Croatia and they literally produced everything that they consumed. You know, they had no money, uh, they bartered for things. My dad actually grew up stomping grapes and drinking wine. <laughs> so most Mediterranean folk drink wine, uh, whether it's a combination with water or by itself from a very, very young age. And uh, so that not only makes you feel very happy, but it's a lot easier doing all the work you need to do to stay alive. So his father was known as the best vintner in the village, not that they would call themselves vintners, he just made the best wine. Uh, but my dad wanted to do something practical. He was the first person in his family to go beyond the eighth grade. And he ended up studying business. And after he got a job working in an office, and a whole year later, he looked and he thought, what have I accomplished this year? And he saw that he had a cabinet full of papers. And he thought, this is not very exciting. I can't get passionate about, you know, you know, if I retire with 70 cabinets full of papers, what does that tell me about my life? So he thought about what gave him great joy and passion which was wine. And so he went back to school to study viticulture and enology. And uh, Croatia was part of Yugoslavia at the time. And the um, Yugoslavians said horrible things about America and what a terrible place it was and awful it was. One of his professors went to, um, on sabbatical 
to UC Berkeley, which was very close by. And uh, after a year, when he came back, the students, my dad wanted to know what it was it like, what's America really like? And the one thing that he remembers that he said was that Napa Valley is paradise. And so he thought, well, why should I die and wait to go to paradise when I can just go to America and go to Napa Valley? So he really decided to find his quest for freedom. He believed America was a land where he could achieve his dreams. And uh, so that's where, that's where he set his mind on reaching Napa Valley. And he did in 1958. And uh, he worked with Lee Stewart of Suverain Cellars, who also uh, trained Warren Vinyarski. Uh, as well as with Brother Timothy at Christian Brothers. And then he had the longest stint with uh, Andre Chelichev at Woody Vineyards. And Andre was known as the Dean of California Winemaking. He literally brought not just science, and, but also the art of winemaking back to Napa after it had really been decimated after Prohibition. And uh, spending all those years helping him make that George de la Tour Private Reserve Cabernet fascinated Robert Mondavi, who was starting his own winery. And Robert actually thought that Napa Valley have the climate, uh, the uh, soil to someday be, you know, produce wines maybe almost as great as the French. And he hired my dad because he wanted my dad, he wanted all that knowledge from, um, from uh, Andre Chelichev. And my father actually made his 1969 Cabernet that put him on the map as well as his cash flow wine, which was the Fumé Blanc, which is one of the reasons we still produce a Fumé Blanc. 69 Georges Latour? The 69 Robert Mondavi Cabernet. Oh, Mondavi, right. After yeah, that. so that was the wine that made Robert Mondavi famous. And that was actually why the owners of Chateau Montalena wanted to hire my father. One of them, Lee Pashich, had actually been having his grapes custom crushed at Robert Mondavi. And he'd met my dad and thought, this guy can really help us make our dream, which is to make some of the best Cabernet in the world. So that's how come he became part of Chateau Montalena. Well, this is, a, you just, you did, I mean, you just, you, you want to write through that whole history. We, we're going to, we're going to go back. We can always go back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're going to go back to the University of Zagreb, right? Mm -hmm. Is yes. that where we went? Yes, uh, University of Zagreb. Mm -hmm. okay. And this is a known university for enology. Yes. At the time. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if the University of Bordeaux is around and the other French schools, but mm -hmm. how many universities in, in Croatia or Yugoslavia at that time could there even been? And the, the kind of education you get from there was, mm -hmm. was good enough, I guess, because I wouldn't know, uh, to mm -hmm. come to America and say, hey, I've got this education in this, in this field mm -hmm. and just decide to pick up and go. And this is the part that intrigues me, not only of your father and other immigrants, it's like, who has the guts? You know, there's other words for that term, but who has the guts to say, uh, I'm going to take off and go see what's there. And you find this passion in your father uh, and this entrepreneurial skills, just fearless when it comes to this, these stories, are, are these the stories we heard around? Absolutely. No, right. this is, I mean, he's so full of passion and when he sets his mind on something, he absolutely accomplishes it. You know, when he left, uh, Yugoslav, he actually fled. He went on a United Nations visa. It was the first year they were actually offering these visas for students to go to different countries to study for the summer and then come back. Well, my dad left planning not to come back. So he had, he had literally collected 32 American dollars. He had a cobbler sewed inside a shoe, his sole of a shoe, and uh, fled and worked with a, at a farm uh, for several years waiting to get a visa to America and uh, actually was in a camp one time. He went to seek political asylum and they just threw him in a camp. And the owner of the farm went to look for him in Nuremberg and found him and was able to bring him back. Um, but he heard that Canada was actually looking for lumberjacks so he decided, well, it's close to America, so why not? I'm going to try anything. Sure. And uh, so he came there, and apparently his train that showed up in Vancouver was late, and the person who was supposed to take him to the Yukon never showed up. So he went to the Vancouver Boys College. He had a connection through his nephew, who was a Catholic priest. Wow. And he had said, if you get into trouble, call them up. So he shows up on their doorstep at midnight, and the next morning, they offer him a job as a dishwasher. So he's like, lumberjack, dishwasher. I'll do the dishwasher. Sure. And uh, so he ended up staying there for a while and eventually ended up working at a paper mill um, as a, a waiter or a busser, I think, until they discovered that he had you know, degrees in science. And so he actually became a chemist and worked analyzing a lot of the paper products that they had. 
And then he's like, you know what? I need to get to America. Let me put an ad in the Wine Institute and see if somebody will hire me. And the wine Stuart, we know, is the wine yes. that we know today. I'm sorry. The Wine Institute that we know of today was at the same absolutely, time? absolutely. Oh. And it's really fun because several years ago, when we were celebrating the 40th anniversary of the Judgment of Paris, and we were doing that in Washington D.C. at the Smithsonian um, Institute, um, and they they have a lot of my dad's papers that he donated there. And my dad was like looking, he said, Violet, can you go through my papers and see what's there? I have no idea what's there. And so I spent literally a day pouring over all the papers. I found his original UN visa that left him wow. yeah, where he went to Germany. And I found the ad, a copy of the ad that he actually had placed in the Wine Institute. I thought, that is so cool. I have it right here. What so. beautiful archives yeah. to tell the story. Yeah. So, Absolutely. So does he, that when he tells these stories at, at dinner time when you were kids, was, was there you know, was the passion was obviously in the story. Was it, a, was it a lesson time? Was it just, this is what I've been through? Or was it something about, you know, take the risk when it's time to take the risk? Because the so $32 in the sole of your shoe and take off with, with just a couple of contacts and, you know, to go be a lumberjack, but end up a dishwasher. And then they find out that you have science skills is kind of what are the odds, right? Exactly, exactly. So did, I think, did, you know, besides having that will and passion, he did happen to be at the right place at the right time where people acknowledge uh, what he could possibly do. But he worked for it. You know, when he was at the paper mill, he said the other, um, you know, the other workers would take time off and they would all play bocce ball. And he actually, you know, his priceless possessions were his textbooks that he brought. He had his paper cardboard suitcase full of textbooks. And while the other guys were playing bocce ball, he would pull out his textbooks and study them oh. so that he wouldn't forget everything that he learned so that when he got to America, he would be prepared for his job. So it wasn't really any accident. And in fact, what he always talks about was that he tried to learn as much as he possibly could from everyone that he came in contact with. And from everyone, he learned something different. And all of this education got absorbed into him so that when it came time for him to really you know, be under the gun and perform, he was able to do so. And he started at Chateau Montalena. He was hired on May 8th, I believe, of 1972. And they were planning on crushing the vintage, you know, September of 72. There was no winery. There was a shell. He literally had to design and build a winery prior to crush so that there would actually be a home for the grapes that he could make into wine. That's phenomenal. Yeah. But yep. he... As he said, it's all that experience that he had, uh, that he learned from so many different people that he was able to do that, plus that passion. Well, I told George, uh, Mr. Tabor, I don't want to call him George, we're not that close, Mr. Tabor, <laughs> I said, mm -hmm. he says it's luck that I showed up at the, at the tasting that day. And I said, I don't really believe in luck. I go, it's really luck is preparation meets opportunity. The opportunities come when they come, but if you're not prepared for something, uh, mm -hmm. then you can't take advantage of it. And that's what luck is. And it sounds like your father, had dreams of the idea. Was it always to start a winery? Was it just to learn the craft? And it, it, certainly it couldn't have been looking for ratings since we didn't have ratings then. So was it just you know, to learn the craft and become the best that he could be? I think he was always trying to be the best that he could be. So when he was 10 years old, um, he left the village he grew up in to go study because there was no further education there. And his father, who had no money, said, son, I, I have nothing to give you but I will tell you something that I hope you take to heart and keep your entire life, which is to every day, do your best, learn something new and make a friend. And That's if you do great. those things, you will always be successful. And so if you think about that, you know, I heard this growing up, I got a little tired of it, frankly, <laughs> but um, the older I got, the more I appreciated it. And now I keep telling all of my employees, again, these are our values. If you do this, whether it's in your business life or your personal life, you can succeed, you know, every day, do your best, learn something new and make a friend. friend. So. I think it's, we get so wound up in minutia, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in these crazy days of COVID and the things that, I mean, it's gotten so much more complicated just to run a business right now, yeah. but you get so caught up in the minutia and there's such a simple formula. It really is because to be happy, uh, it doesn't mean I've got a 95 from the spectator. Really. It means that I have friends and I'm proud of what I do and I work hard. I mean, that's, you can always go to sleep at night with that thought and know that you're going to be all right. Uh, the other stuff is sort of irrelevant. Um, 
I was when I was talking to Mr. Tabor about uh, the Jesuit repairs and him just showing up, you know, decided to show up. I said, "You're trying to tell me that um, that if you're walking down Champs Elysees that day and." a young French woman bumped into you and said, let's go have a drink that you wouldn't have showed up. He goes, absolutely. I wouldn't have been there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so your father lands. One of the intriguing parts of the story that uh, is in the book is he lands himself in front of a hotel, a small hotel in St. Helena, not even sure where he's at, not even sure what to do. Doesn't know where he's going to sleep. Has $32 sewn in his shoe and really doesn't have a place to go. And, I guess there was a light burning in the window or something. What, tell, tell us a little bit about that. Well, I believe he ran into somebody and, and asked about, is there a place to stay in this town? They said, yes, go around the corner and there's the St. Helena Hotel. And so he showed up and uh, asked if there was room and they said yes. And I believe it was either one or two dollars. I can't remember which one it was now for the cost of the room. And he said, well, which room? He says, go upstairs and pick any rich room you want. And uh, so when he woke up the next morning, he uh, used their telephone to call Lee Stewart. And Lee Stewart came in his pickup truck uh, to come bring him to the winery. And what was really amazing to my father was that here he is, a complete stranger. You know, he'd never seen America before. He was here in Napa Valley, his paradise that he'd been trying to get to for years. And he comes to the winery. And surrounding the winery are Zinfandel wines, vines. And he looks at them and he goes, this is Plavats Mali. This is, this is native to my homeland of Croatia. This is amazing. I found a friend in America. And uh, so he asked him, you know, where do these grapes come from? And uh, uh, Lee said, you know, well, we're not really sure where they come from. And my dad thought, that's it. They've got to come from Croatia. So that that's was- That's so fascinating uh, because uh, just to dovetail off of that, the, the, the plight of Zinfandel, I mean, how many times it was tried to be the- uh, indigenous grape, the only Vitis vinifera grape we have in America, but that's not true. You know, there was rumored that Hazarathi brought them in the 1800s. We don't know if that's true. Uh, Primitivo was supposedly part of its, uh, its heritage. But that's not true because the DNA actually goes back to Croatia. It does. And actually, Primitivo is Zinfandel, but it's not the origination of Zinfandel. So if you think about this, would any Italian in their right mind call something Italian Primitivo? Of course not. It's primitive. It's from those savages across the Adriatic. That's right. <laughs> so it came, it, it came in from somewhere else. And uh, so Carol Meredith was able to prove, with the help of two Croatian uh, scientists who actually were at University of Zagreb, um, so uh, Eddie Malatic and Ivan Page, and they actually found the original Zinfandel vine. And it took a while because, you know, it, it, so, so the original Cyrlian, um, vine is called Cyrlianek, which is hard for Americans to pronounce, but it had died off after Phylloxera hit Croatia. And it really wasn't replanted very well because, you know, people weren't as happy with it. It, it got moldy when it rained and it didn't ripen evenly, which are very characteristic of Zinfandel. Mm -hmm. Its offspring though, was Plavitz Mali. That was the one, and that was widely planted. So you think about these Croatians, they don't have the nice, you know, pristine vineyards that we do here. Okay, here's this vine, here's this vine. They just mix everything up all together. And so it took a while to find the vine, but it was proven through genetic um, tracing that it is the or origin of Zinfandel. You so just made that very happy. You just connected huge dots for me because I've tasted many Plavitz Mali here. Uh, brought in Slovenian and other parts of that cent central Europe that I did did not connect it to being Zinfandel. Mm -hmm. so that makes a ton of sense now. And I appreciate that because I've been trying to figure out some of these. Well, when we were in Croatia, we've been, we went to the tourist side of, of uh, Croatia. We were in Havar, Dubrovnik and Split. Mm -hmm. uh, beautiful. And, mm -hmm. and the wines at, at the restaurants were gorgeous. And I'm with my friends like, well, what's this about? I'm like, I have no idea. I can't pronounce it, and they don't they don't grow Cabernet here, and so I relied on the Psalms and the waiters to t choose something based on what we're eating, and was fascinated by it. Why do you think these other types of grapes that are so uh, well? Let me preface this: I'm Armenian. There's a Armenian trade growing in, in Armenia. They use a grape called Areni primarily. There's another one called Sireni. They make nice wines. I don't consider them noble wines, but mm -hmm. I thought the wines from Croatia were absolutely gorgeous and uh, what can I say they're world-class in their character mm -hmm. as a grape so how come those things haven't come to America why aren't we planting those things here 
Well, you know, they're not actually recognized as varietals. And we found this out because we had a vine of Srilienak, which is a long story. Ridge actually did, um, they ended up bringing in hundreds of um, Srilienak vines to UC Davis to do studies, et cetera, et cetera. They ended up with 12 vines after all of those hundreds, and they gave us one of those vines. We ended up budding it to some old Merlot that we had in our Calistoga vineyard. So when we looked at this, um, Apparently, Cerlianac uh, is not a registered uh, varietal uh, with, with um, the government. Mm. And in order to bring something in as a varietal, it has to be that. So, uh, I see. in other words, it has to be a fanciful name. But really, what happened was uh, during communism, there was no impetus to and no incentive to actually produce things of quality because you, it didn't matter what you did, so you may as well not put the effort out. And so that knowledge um, of fine winemaking, which had been through hundreds of years in Croatia, was lost. And so there was an emphasis on making cheap wines. And uh, so that kind of attitude was what ha you know, Croatia started with once it declared independence. Um, so those aren't the kind of wines that you send out. I think somebody, a friend of mine, when I was in, um, uh, gosh, in college said, oh, I found this wine from Croatia. You know, let's try it. It was, it was a Chardonnay and it was terrible. Like, why would I drink a Chardonnay from Croatia? It was like three or four dollars or something like that. Funny. But, um, well, interesting. yeah, so now I think, you know, now that Croatia has declared independence, there's, there's so many more vintners now who are taking these native varieties. Most of those varieties, there used to be over 500 native varieties in Croatia. And again, with Phylloxera, most of those died off. There's mm -hmm. maybe about 150 now. And those are being planted. I think that there's more interest now in working with the native varietals uh, with fine winemaking. Because when my father came there, he established a winery in 1996 and uh, was immediately um, chastised by all the local winemakers for actually putting his wine in barrels. They're like, you crazy man, why are you, why are you putting your wine in barrique? You may as well throw it in the Adriatic, you know, for all the good it'll do you. And so that kept up for years after years after years. And literally one summer I was being berated by all these guys for, ah, oh, barik, barik. And then the next summer I come back and I see all these bottles in the airport uh, uh, store and the ones that say barik on them are more expensive. So it was, uh, they finally sort of caught on. That's and, really you know. funny. Yeah. They're using amphora before that. They're using clay pots, I think. I mean, that's still. Oh, there's there's a winery now that's like brought back the amphoras. No, it's just, it's, it's. Um, they're using concrete you know, back then. It's I mean, marketing. So, yeah. That is I, right. You know, I am sure Croatia, you know, has been there since the Greek and Roman times. Uh, we knew that uh, the Greeks were producing. The Greeks actually talked about some of the best wine being produced on the island of Vis, which is uh, part of Croatia. Uh, and that was several hundred BC. So the history of winemaking in that area has gone on for many, many, many centuries. You know, that's one of the things, and we'll, we'll get back to the judgment of Paris here in a second, but uh, the, the, the passion that your father has to have, the passion that you have, the passion, that, and my passion is, I, I've been telling my customers, it's, I've been doing, this is my 30th year of doing this, mm -hmm. tasting wines every Tuesday for 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, but the realization of what the value of the, the beverage is, what wine really is, its connection to the earth and the time of, of, of place and, and, and uh, a, pl a sense of time and place mm -hmm. is, is probably 10 years old for me. And it takes that kind of realization and passion to, to make things happen in this industry. And we talk about, um, you know, there's lots and lots of winemakers and some are really, really good and there's some just aren't that great let's face it there are good doctors and bad doctors and there's maybe there's good wine clubs and bad cl wine clubs too but um it, it the formula like a chef uh, and we're tied to the food business with my daughter's uh, she's a baking chef it's about the passion it's about what you how much commitment you're going to put into making the best product you can that make people feel something mm -hmm. your dad must have had this when he landed in St. Helena and to go through those risks and to, to, to put $32 in his shoe, not to take that story too far, but to show up and see, you know, the leaves of a vine and say, this is for my homeland. Mm -hmm. and, and that inspires him even more to do the best and then to do what he ended up doing. So uh, let's jump to Chateau Montalina. Mm -hmm. um, your father made the 72. Mm-hmm. That was the, that was, we carried that wine in my dad's store. 
-hmm. In fact, it was the wine of the month, and I'll dig up the newsletter and send it to you uh, before the 73, obviously. Right. Uh, but we featured that wine as one of the wines of the month because Mr. Barrett was our neighbor. He used to come in the store, and he goes, Paul, could you please bring some wines in? I'm tired of donating stuff to everybody in Palos Verdes, so mm -hmm. we just have them here so I can point them somewhere. Mm -hmm. So how fascinating that we had your father's first wine at Montalena. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the story of Montalena is in the book. I want people to read about it, but it's, you know, Mr. Barrett was an attorney from Torrance who had friends in the construction, big developers, and Ernie Hahn, I think, was one of them. And right. they, um, mm -hmm. he used to come in the store all the time as well. So here's this tasting. Um, Stephen Spurrier being an Englishman in, in, in uh, Paris, uh, Rue Madeleine, he had his store. He was doing the Academy Devant. And I understand it was really Patricia Gallagher's idea to maybe confront the French uh, wines with, with California wines. It, it was actually, and because they were trying to figure out, you know, what is some way that we can do to actually promote this? So that whole concept of, you know, an Englishman trying to sell wine in Paris. Um, <laughs> well, that's, that's just plainly ridiculous. Right. Uh, so really trying to drum up some publicity and uh, Patricia had known that they'd been tasting some wines from California that they were really excited about. So she thought, well, wouldn't it be really cool to actually put some of these California wines and taste them next to the French and really introduce them to something that they've never had a chance to experience. So um, she'd been to California a few times, you know, came to your store, which is great, um, as had Stephen. And so that idea really took off. And I think more people talk about Stephen than they do about Patricia. But I think the idea was that together they came up with something that really changed the world. But they didn't have much place to go. I mean, I'm going to read you this first sentence in chapter 16 of the book. It says, in the summer of 1975, Patricia Gallagher was making plans to visit her sister in Palos Verdes Estates, the wealthy coastal community south of Los Angeles. And then it talks about how Mr. Spurrier you know, got a hold of her and said, you need to get the nap and find some wines. But what, were, what was there? Like 25 wineries maybe or 50 at the moment? Not, not 50, I don't think. Not that many wineries, and they really wanted to focus on the 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 smaller, more boutique wineries. And I mention this because when Robert Mondavi started his winery, and my father worked for him, um, he started out small, but he kept getting bigger and bigger. That was one of the reasons my dad um, felt comfortable moving to Chateau Montalena because the idea was to produce really only a small quantity. Um, and actually, my dad ended up hiring Zelma Long. Uh, to take really? his place. So she was there as an intern for a while. She'd studied biology and he saw a lot of promise in her and convinced her to come work in the wine industry. And so um, she wow. took over his position there and uh, yeah, another another strong winemaker. So, and so when, he, when, he, when he tells a story about the, the vinting the 73 mm -hmm. and the, you know, the movie Bottle Shock talks about, you know, what they saw on Attorney Brown, all that, but it was just, he was just trying to make the best wine he could with what he had. I don't remember if those were estate grapes. Were they estate grapes at the time? Because No, no. And actually, the, the real story, so the 72 was the very first vintage at Chateau Montalena. Right. 73 was the second. Um, as I mentioned, my dad had to literally build a winery from the ground up. And when they were bottling the 72 vintage, there was one part that had been delayed and the mechanic who was supposed to install that part on the bottling line uh, was sick. So, but they had to bottle before crush. So that part was actually um, a vacuum pump that went on the corker that was responsible for removing the oxygen yeah, from right. the neck of the bottle. And that was a 72 vintage. So the wine had literally been protected from oxygen during fermentation, during bottling. And then with some of this oxygen, you know, pushed into the top of it, uh, it actually had a temporary oxidizing effect. So that was a 72 vintage, lasted for a little bit. You know, they agreed, gosh, this tastes great. Um, wait a little bit, disappeared. And so that was a 72. Um, oh, wow. in seven, yeah, so, so, the, so the actual premise of bottle shock is not correct. There's so many things that are, there are more things that are untrue about that movie than there are that are true. And I think, um, you know, most people now that have heard about the Judgment of Paris have heard about it through bottle shock, which is not the real story. Sorry. And uh, so. The dramatization. In fact, I met. Dramatization. The producer, Absolutely. Met, uh, what's her name? I can't remember her name now. The, the producer of the show. I met her at Montalena. We kind of did this little promotion because I was giving away the, the video with 
some bottles of Montalana Chardonnay, but I can't, what was her name? Anyway, uh, so but here we are in Napa, and it's, I think, I, I did count some, at some time, I think there were 25 wineries, and these wineries, certainly we didn't have the technology, we didn't have all the know-how, we had some colleges here in America, the, uh, your father went to Zagreb, you know, there's the University of Bordeaux and some others in France, but really, these pioneers weren't born of that age of winemaking, they were born of bootstraps, I mean, Warren Winnie Arce was a bootstrapper, he didn't bother with some of those things how and this is probably too big a question but like say how different is it today when it comes to uh bringing people in to work in the winery what are we looking for are we looking for the character that your father was or are we looking for this educated biologist uh, how has that changed for do you think from the times of those days i think today as in those days there's a combination of things that we look for. And it, it depends on what kind of position are you looking for? You know, many people fall in love with wine and they want to come and get into the wine industry. So what do they do? Well, the easiest thing is to work in the tasting room, meet people, talk about wine, learn, educate yourself. But if you're actually interested in being a vintner, you know, oftentimes you end up saying, hey, I'm gonna work as an intern for Harvest for free. Let me educate myself. Um, you know, there is something to be had about education and having a degree in viticulture and enology, you know, as well as chemistry. So all of these things can be very important. But what's also very important is a sense of passion and a sense of art, because wine is something that truly is an art. You know, I'm a musician, so I'm always comparing music and wine. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they're very similar in that they, you know, make people happy and bring them together. They can be sometimes the most simple of things. And they can also be the most complex of things that with each revisiting, you get more and more and more. And there's a time and a place for all of those. So I know the question was about getting into the wine industry. There's a lot more people these days who want to get in the wine industry than there were back in those days. But it's also a much larger industry. You know, when I was growing up, um, you know, people didn't go out to eat all the time. You know, you went out to a fancy restaurant, which was usually French and food was heavy and it took you a month to recover from, you know, the one meal that you had. You know, people had wine for special occasions. But, you know, growing up in Napa Valley, though, you grow up with a lot of vintners. You know, when I went to high school, I didn't see kids drinking because they did it at home with their parents. And in, right. in fact, at my you know Catholic high school, we had a, a graduation party where some of the parents brought the wines and it was all chaperoned. And um, you know, it's a very different situation than it was these days. I, I guess you could say it was a little more like the Wild West or really it was a little more like Europe, uh, which is how I was raised as a Croatian, as a European, uh, but in the freedom of America. You know, for my dad, you know, for him breaking grounds on July 4th of 1977 for Gurga Chills yeah. was one of the proudest moments of his life because for he sure. said, this is the moment, you know, here I am, I'm achieving my dream to become a business owner and to be in control of my own destiny and not have somebody tell me what I had to do, you know, and yes, it's going to be hard, but, um, you know, he was used to hard work and the fact that he you know, was able to make wines that, you know, not just the Mondavi 69 Cabernet, but the 73 Montalena Chardonnay, you know, these wines put people on the map. And to be able to take all that knowledge and expertise and to found his own winery in conjunction with, you know, Austin Hills and Mary Lee Strebel of the Hills Brothers Coffee family, um, it was a dream come true. Do you think, it's funny, you, here he is at 77, opening his own winery, the dream of a lifetime, like he said. I, there's, a, there's a story in uh, the Cornet magazine, which, is, uh, which was the um, Reader's Digest of its time, I think the 50s, about my grandfather who opened a carpet store here. And he came and he, he took my grandmother to the hills of Hollywood and looked over the Los Angeles and told her that the streets were paved with gold here. And he came from a you know, suppressed uh, Turkey environment, the Ottoman Empire. So do you think there's a different perspective of what the American dream is today or that it's still alive with with immigration proper immigration I won't get political here but um, they're coming here that with people like your father my grandfather and my father as well come here because of that freedom and a chance to achieve what they've achieved do you have, do you like telling that story and do you do you get positive response when you tell that story and do like people go yeah I get it I get it now mm -hmm. 
people absolutely do love that story. And I think that's one of the reasons my father's story resonates with so many people, that idea that you can work hard, you can, you know, fight hard for your passion and your dream and achieve it. And, you know, with all the problems that America has, it is still a place where people look at as, you know, this is my dream you know, right. to come to America. And it often turns out to be very different than what they expected. But even with all of its flaws, there is still no place like it on earth. So, you know, I, I, I speak, I don't, I don't speak very good French. But I, I, I don't speak French, French at all. So, Too many vowels. <laughs> it's hard. But because my father spoke when he grew up in Cairo, I, I learned it with him and mm -hmm. we have a blast with it. But I, ha I do have many young women who teach French in America that came from France and they're my teachers. And one of them not too long ago, maybe it was six to nine months ago mm -hmm. said uh, that the American dream is a farce. Mm -hmm. She said this in English, by the way. So, mm -hmm. so I would understand. Mm -hmm. So, and I said, what do you mean? And we got into this political conversation. Well, she recently bought her first house mm -hmm. and the attitudes changed. Mm -hmm. She now feels like she's accomplished something and it's because of that she was able it's because of her coming here she works mm -hmm. hard she teaches french in like three colleges and but mm -hmm. she's now realized what that dream actually means because it's played out for her at least in, the, in that sense right. so in 1977 he starts gurgit's gurgit's estates and had the fame of the judgment of paris changed him uh did he care were the accolades important what impact did it have on him as a person and then on the winery when it got started? Well, it's interesting because people often ask, so, you know, what, what was it like once your dad won and, you know, how did she, I'm like, it didn't really, it just sort of, you know, he remained the same person, but I think he actually had more confidence in the fact that all of those years of hard work and effort and learning from so many people have actually paid off. Um, so, you know, he continued to work hard. I, I spent, I think from the time he was at Mandavi when I was, you know, this high, mm -hmm. he was taking me to work with him. And, you know, every weekend he would go to work. And uh, I remember when um, he left Chateau Montalena, I was really sad because I was in love. I mean, here's this underground castle with a Chinese lake with these yeah. gorgeous Chinese gazebos <laughs> on it. You know, it is a kid's heaven. Phenomenal. And uh, so I'm like, so we're going to this flat land where there's nothing and we're gonna build something that's stucco and plywood and concrete. That doesn't sound very appealing. Um, but you know, no matter you know how far he got, he never stopped. And always, um, you know, literally every weekend would take me with him. And you were talking about, you know, was it education? Was it fun? It was all wrapped together. You know, I think when I was very young, I pretty much knew most of the winemakers in Napa. There weren't that many back then. You know, my dad would show me vines and say, well, this is, you know, what a Chardonnay leaf looks like compared to a, a Cabernet. Being an only child, my father made it very clear that I was going to be a winemaker and follow in his footsteps. And uh, being the proper stubborn Croatian with the stubborn Croatian genes, I would always say no. Now, you know, I grew up literally next to him, absorbing all this information, uh, you know, spending all of this time at, you know, most of the wineries from Montalena, uh, a little bit at Robert Mondavi, and then of course at Gurgich Hills. Um, but I always wanted to, I had so many interests, you know, besides music, I enjoyed writing and literature and, uh, uh, so many different kinds of signs that it'd be hard for me to go, you know, to figure out what to go in. I actually ended up um, going to UC Davis because that's the only college application my dad would sign. And I ended up taking music and Latin. So uh, while I was there, I, of course, I, I, you know, to me, I used to read science textbooks for fun. And so the idea of having to go and study for something that I'd already been doing and instinctively knew how to do just didn't make as much sense where I felt like I needed the, you know, I needed to study music with other musicians, with people that could really move me forward in that direction. And so I also ended up getting a graduate degree uh, in harpsichord uh, performance. And, you know, my father kept being worried that I would never come home. And, uh, but I did. And I think the more, cause I, I literally, I started in the cellar. I started on the bottling line. Um, I worked in the cellar. I worked in the laboratory for a long time. I love that because then I didn't need to, you know, communicate with people. I could just be by myself and analyze wines. 
um, and then worked in the tasting room, worked in sales admin and accounting. And when I finally started going out learning how to sell, that was the worst thing for me because my father was such, such an amazing speaker. I literally grew up going to vintner dinners from the time I was a small child. And when he opened his mouth to speak, people's jaws dropped. And so I grew up with this and being the horribly painful introvert that I was, I'm like, I'm never going to be able to do that. Oh, God forbid. Um, but he forced me to do it and kept forcing me. And it was, it was amazing. At one point, I finally got over this terror that I had of speaking in public and became comfortable with it. I, you would not guess in any remote fashion that you have a problem with public speaking and or camera, no less. So mm -hmm. congratulations well, I, for getting over that. <laughs> thank, well, you know what? I, I used to, you know, my, I was a little upset at my dad for making me do this, that thing that was so painful to me. But I have never ceased to thank him for that opportunity to, you know, learn and grow and do something that I never would have done on my own. So, Great lessons to, yeah, that, it's amazing. that are simple but important. And so, you know, it sounds to me that regardless of your opposition and your, your uh, teenage resistance, that you were going to be in the wine business. That was just, <laughs> it was going to end up that way. <laughs> that is absolutely true. So I do happen to love wine. I think a lot of it was the fact that my dad was so accomplished and so talented at what he did that, you know, reaching his level or even, you know, surpassing it was just unimaginable to me. So. Well, 77, I mean, look in any, in any business environment, you know, to run uh, 43 years already is phenomenal in any case, and particularly in something as volatile as what, which is really an agricultural business. Wine is it's, it's ebbs and flows with agriculture and crops and, and consumer needs. Um, we are, I had this conversation with Mike Salachi too a little bit, and we we're talking about you know the cost of Napa land and like if if somebody's let's just take the typical scenario these days. I'm a, I'm a government contractor and I used to make freeways and now I've got so much money I don't know what to do with it, so I build a winery. Or and that's sarcastic, of course. Uh, or as a surgeon and now I get the wine business. So enamored with this idea and I build this this huge thing and and it, I can't make any money because I've spent you know who knows on the land and then the structure, and I'm forced to sell these wines at hundreds of dollars a bottle just to you know, get my costs back, and who's buying them right now? So to, in today's environment, what is Napa like? What, it, how do you feel it's changed? And this doesn't, I don't mean this in a bad way, it's just, it's, it's more commercial than it was. Uh, it's a great tourist destination, and, and I think it's fabulous for people to go visit and, and learn the wine trade, or at least get exposed to it. But from an operations standpoint, how is this, changed since 1977 you know it's huge i don't know how people can afford to get in the business these days with land costing you know at least half a million dollars an acre we you know we are so lucky that my father had the wisdom to actually purchase land a long time ago uh, even you know our property in yonville uh it's 75 acres plus a beautiful victorian mansion we have the second oldest, but the largest old Cabernet vineyard in Napa Valley, which was planted wow. in 1959. There are 25 acres of it. Um, when that opportunity came for him to buy it at $70,000 for the entire thing, uh, he decided he was going to wait until the price went down. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, multiple <laughs> times later, the, and the price kept going up, and uh, wow. he was finally able to purchase it, but still nowhere near the astronomical prices that we have these days. So we were very well... Um, placed uh, a number of years ago. We purchased that last vineyard in the 90s. And uh, so we now have five vineyards and we've been estate grown uh, officially since 2003. Everything is certified organic. Um, we ah, have, you know, for us, natural farming is the most important way of actually producing grapes of the highest quality and also preserving the longevity of the vines. You know, when you take care of the vines, they're going to last a lot longer. Um, so we you have. Shows that as, a, as one of the questions I was talking about here, the idea of organic, biodynamic, sustainable, all these buzzwords that are going around there, they mean something, of course, but. Do you think that that's the ultimate 
future of the wine industry that and one of the comments, let's go back a little bit. One of the comments I get a lot, particularly from indigenous uh, winemakers from Europe is my kids are playing in this vineyard. They're crawling around in that dirt and they're screwing around, they're touching the vine. So I don't want pesticides and things that don't belong there yeah, mm -hmm. on them. Is that, is that the prevailing attitude? I don't think that's the prevailing attitude. I think, you know, there are more and more wineries that are being owned by corporations and they're looking out for a certain level of profitability in a certain time period. You know, because we are not only family owned, but family operated, we have the ability to really think about the long term effects. And for us, you know, short term profitability doesn't mean anything when you think about, you know, generations in the future losing you know, this amazing legacy that we've built. And so really making sure that our vineyards continue um, to produce, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's that important. And I, I guess I didn't really think about the kid thing until I had a child of my own. And when my son was a year or two years old, his favorite food was grapes. And I have this great <laughs> picture of him in Yonville. He's standing up. He's like literally his arms like this. He's reaching for the grapes. And um, I just remember looking at that going, I feel completely safe having him do that because of how we farm. That's and, amazing. you know, the nature of, we're not just making a product and selling it. You know, for us, this is something that is, you know, born of the land that we own. It is the spirit of the soil. It is, it is, it is, a, it is a very spiritual thing as well and a product of love and a true art. And so these things are far beyond, okay, let's make a profit here and there. You know, um, that's is, not a sustainable way of, of doing your business. And I don't know that that's prevailing, but I think the people that are family owned and operated and that have learned the benefits of natural farming, I'll say natural for, you know, there, there are many different words that people bandy about. You know, organic certification is very clear about what that is. You know, who knows when they say, oh, I'm sustainable, that can mean anything. You know, for us, we weren't about certification. We were about doing this because it was the right thing to do. Um, we didn't even think about marketing it or doing anything with it until Whole Foods said, well, we really want to see this on the label uh, because our customers care. So for us, it's not a ways of marketing. Um, it is really part of the whole philosophy we have of doing things as naturally as possible and as healthily as possible. Um, you know, you cannot make great wines without having great grapes. And the best way to do that is to have that complete control That's and true. to do it naturally and authentically because, you know, part of how we farm, because we farm naturally, um, we have natural yeast on our grapes that we ferment with. Um, that is the most possible sense of place and authenticity that you can mm -hmm. get in a wine. There's nothing more authentic than that. This, this wine is from this place and this time and it's magical. So I does remember- organic, Does the organic mm -hmm. definition require natural yeast? Um, it doesn't, it's just something that we do. It's, it's our, it's our um, what organic um, does not like though is any added sulfites, which is really doesn't make very much sense because they are natural. natural. And biodynamic certification, which is much more stringent, which we actually went through for a period of time, um, allows the use of additional sulfites without which, and in addition to that, sulfites are produced during the winemaking process. So I think this happens when, you know, there's some people, there, there's a percentage of the population that's allergic to sulfites. Um, and that's great so that they know that it's there. Right. Uh, but there's far more sulfites in dried fruit than there are in most wines, especially high quality wines. So when people talk about, oh, these sulfites, are they bad for me? I'm like, no, absolutely not. Um, but, you know, it's all a matter of perspective. We, well, now we hear that a lot. And uh, I've read many times there's no validated reaction unless it's like, you know, I, well, I used to say, if you go to the Sizzler salad bar, you're probably ingesting more sulfites in that piece of lettuce than you've ever ingested in a bottle of wine. But uh, you said a couple of things that are really interesting. One is I had a customer recently, and we started a natural wine series. I don't know if you've read about the uh, Von Method Naturale from France. It's a new uh, mm -hmm. certification. It requires only organic farm, well, only, it requires organic farming, um, dry farming, and hand-picked uh, mm -hmm. grapes. And, and they're 
the funny thing is they're testing this idea, this little insignia for three mm -hmm. years. It took them 10 years to come up with the definition. And now they're going to mm -hmm. test this idea for three years. But I had a customer mm -hmm. complain recently and I sent her, uh, when we buy a wine that's organic or biodynamic, we ask the winery to fill out, just check off the boxes, dry farm, less than 25 parts per million, whatever the number is of sulfur. And many wineries I taste are organic and or biodynamic and don't have the sticker or the certification label on the back because they just do it like you're doing. They do it for the passion of doing it and they want to do it right. And that's mm -hmm. what they do. Um, because she, she complained to me. She goes, this is not organic. I know what organic. I can buy Trader Joe's organic for three ninety nine, and it says organic on the back. I said, ma'am, you know, I know this is organic because the winemaker told me I was, mm -hmm. it was in the office here, but mm -hmm. she complained about it. So, um, I think it's a, I think it's an important movement. Uh, and when you talked about corporations and this is the part that drives my side of the business crazy, mm -hmm. they've, they've created this influx of gallonage of one euro per liter wines that come in. I know, I know the path. They come in New York, they go, they come in New Jersey, go up to New York, they get bottled in a billion different names and they go out in the marketplace They're on Groupon, you know, 40, 15 bottles for 45 bucks. And I have a problem with that because it completely defeats the experience that you're trying to create, that I'm trying to create, that somebody sits down with a glass of wine and feels something from that vendor, from that winery, from that soil, from that weather, uh, from their philosophy. And you can't do that in 20,000 gallon Tetra Tech, 20,000 liter Tetra Tech bladders at a dollar, a dollar. Mm -hmm. I have a very good friend who was selling one of these competitive clubs of mine, two liter, $2 per liter wines. And he got beat by somebody selling $1 per liter wines. And you know, you just said it, you can't make good wine from bad grapes. Mm -hmm. For a lot, dollar a liter, what, what are you gonna get? Is you're gonna get dollar per liter wines. And so yeah. um, huge companies have come in millions of dollars from uh, venture capitalists, because it's such a, an enamored, romantic business. We want to be in the wine business, and they don't know how to make it, so they just do it this way. And it's making my job really hard. Mm -hmm. Tell me about um, the marketing of Napa wines, particularly during COVID. Uh, restaurants are closed. Um, what have you heard from your neighbors, and how are we going to survive these? this thing? So this is, uh, gosh, it's been a really difficult time for all of us. Um, and some of us are more or better equipped than others. You know, those of us who have always sold in all avenues are doing better because we've um, literally since Gross and Safeway got the idea that, well, maybe we could have some fine wine in our store. We've been selling to them. We've been selling wherever our customers are. Um, and those, those outlets are doing very well. And people are also buying wines that they know. Uh, wines that are iconic. They're not necessarily trying out new and different things. If you have set yourself up as, I'm a restaurant only wine, I'm sorry, you know, you're in trouble. You know, you're selling at a huge discount now to small independent shops. You're not going to be selling to the big guys because they're so busy, they can't add anything. Um, you're going to be selling to the small, say, great discount. And now it's an opportunity for people to try things that they might not have tried before um, at a much better price. But it's been interesting. I mean, we shut down on March 13th and the following Monday, uh, we sent out our wine club shipment. Um, we pretty much kept most of our people home except the essential ones to answer phones, send the club and literally found that people loved us calling to ask, did you get your wine club shipment? Would you like to schedule a virtual tasting so we can talk to you? We've never done this before. We're like, we have to have some way of connecting. People loved getting the phone right. call from us. And in one, you know, every year for my dad's birthday, we have a great, great big sale. So that's, you know, for the month of April. We had people who would reorder cases three or four times within that time period because they were stuck at home. Right. And so, um, and a number of wineries have found that, you know, online direct sales to their customers have risen considerably. Most of them have. Um, restaurants, that's been really very difficult, you know, unless you're on a wine, you know, by the glass program where they decide to feature you in a takeout, but you're still not selling as much as you ever did before. So it's just a very, very difficult situation. And we don't know when we're going to be able to get out of it. 
you know, this is clearly very contagious. We're learning more about, you know, what's safe and what's, you know, not safe. Uh, but the fact that not everybody is adhering to the guidelines and has their personal views about what should be done has made it difficult. You know, if, you know, we, we reopened that we had to sort of, well, we didn't close back down because we were, you know, doing completely safe uh, social distancing with masks outside, outside, but inside has had to close down for a while because of the number of cases going up. Well, so, it's interesting because you, well, outside, which the fact to have outside is great, mm -hmm. uh, but the, there are going to be a lot of wineries. Well, when I was up last and we stopped at the Oxbow and we had coffee with the wine journalist from the Napa Valley Register, and I think I've said this a couple of times on this podcast. I thought it was going to be an interview about me. It wasn't about me. <laughs> she was, she was asking questions like, "Well, how do you think Napa Winery should get through?" Uh, you know, she said something to the effect of, "We're learning how to chat up here." Mm -hmm. And, I, and yes. this is just before COVID, and I thought, well, if I have a robust uh, mm -hmm. digital presence, I've, like here at Wine of the Month Club. If, if I don't chat, I probably lose 40% of my business because so much of it comes through chat and texting and those methodologies. And if there are a lot of wineries in Napa that don't do that and they relied on foot traffic, which there must be, at right. no, at no uh, disrespect to them, they just, you know, this is this was a great business and we're having fun. No. Are we going to see yeah. more corporate takeovers then? Like, you know, vintage estates or, you know, these other guys are out there buying up whatever they can buy? You know, it's entirely possible. I think it's it's going to be difficult for some to get through. It'll be easier for some others. But I think any time that there's a crisis, there are those who are able and are in a position to take advantage of those things and actually improve their business model and succeed, and those who won't. So That's who knows what it will look like. That was no. Right on. So tell me about then when we get out of this thing, what's future of Gergich, um, varietals, uh, volume, what, anything that's on the horizon that's, uh, that's in your plan to, I don't know if we really can change the Gergich is so great and this, the name is so great and mm -hmm. looking forward to, to selling some more because I, when you said that people are buying, mm -hmm. this is what I want to get to, mm -hmm. the COVID thing has taught us a lot in the marketing side of this and you've seen it now. Uh, people are buying what they understand. So I've been selling brands. You know, I'm not a I'm not, typically I don't sell brands because typically brands didn't need me to sell the wines for them. You know, they uh, that out this outlet is no longer that kind of outlet. In the early days for Chateau Montalena seventy two Chardonnay, yes, you know they they need all the exposure they could get, but it's not important anymore. Um, so uh, people were buying things they know uh, mm -hmm. from me and. I never really carried them, but I'm carrying them now. I've learned that mm -hmm. the the number of contacts, and you just said it with the phone calls, is mm -hmm. a huge thing, particularly during this COVID thing. The more you contact them, where they don't want to open the email, that's okay, but they might open the next one, mm -hmm. and they're responding to them. And mm -hmm. and, and the the other thing that's crazy that's happened here is my customer service rating, which has always been very high, has gotten higher, mm -hmm. and we turned the phones off for six weeks. Yeah. Between chat and texting and emailing, you know, they were buying more. So our marketing, and let's face it, you know, we are here to sell stuff, you know, as a winery, and you, you brought it up with the sulfur edition, you know, you, a, a winery maker is not going to let a whole crop go to, the, go to waste because it might get moldy because we didn't put sulfur on it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, you're going to, we're trying to make money here. We're trying to earn a living and treat people to our skills. But um, so it's, it's, it's an interesting time for Napa, an interesting time for the wine industry. On the flip side of all that, sales are up. <laughs> so <laughs> we're very happy yeah. about that. <laughs> but, well, and hopefully it continues. I mean, that's a the thing. There's, there's so much uncertainty. I think, you know, what's, what's, what I really enjoyed throughout my career is the kind of comments that I've gotten from people. Um, you know, we've been around for a long time. We're an iconic brand, but I think for a while there, people forgot what we tasted like. And so when we would go out and taste people, they're like, oh my gosh, I forgot this was so good. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what's happening now as well. I, my favorite comment is, oh, I don't like Chardonnay, but I love yours. And I yeah, that's great all the time. 
So I think, and also younger people, you know, so many wineries like, oh, how are we going to get to the millennials? How are we going to get to them? And I'm like, I look in my tasting room, at least back when I used to, and I'm like, this is full of millennials yeah. drinking wine, you know? Um, and you, when you ask them, so, you know, how did you learn about our wines? Oh my gosh, our parents introduced them to us and we love them. You know, that's been a huge one. That's and great. In, in fact, when we opened our tasting, we opened on June 10th, I think I was there that weekend, and there was a group of young people there, um, you know, ha, you know, outside enjoying, and I asked them, so, wow, how did you, have you had Gurga Chills before? Like, no, we've never had your wine. So why did you come up here? Like, we were looking for a, just a place to get away from San Francisco that had a beautiful outdoor space, and we are here, and we love the space, and we love your wines, and wow, wow this is great. So I think some of it is just opportunity and making sure that you have the opportunity uh, and that the opportunity is presented. You, know? you may have just opened the safe to how to get to millennials because everybody in this business has been trying to figure that out for a hundred years, for 900 years, for 20 years. Like, what are these millennials? They're millennials. They're, oh. <laughs> I have three of them myself and I don't understand them. So mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, I don't want to take much more of your time. Actually, I think we're, we should wrap this up. Mm -hmm. I would love to do it again, maybe in person next time. This We didn't even really scratch the surface on some of the judgment of Paris, but I really wanted to hear about your your career and, and the path of the company and so many things happening to us right now in this industry that I wanted to get your take on that. So uh, I really appreciate this opportunity, and I hope we get up to see you. And Thank you. I hope so, too. Bring in some uh, – this is going to go out with um, – an offer on some Gurgage wines through the Cab and the Rosé and the Shard and all the wines that you're carrying. And I'll get with Michelle on that. So uh, be safe and thank you so much for the time. And if you get a chance to convey that to your father, um, thank him for, you know, I, I told George Tabor, I said, thank you for this job. Because, mm -hmm. you know, before we get off, George says, I think maybe it would have taken five to 10 years for, California wine to get its traction. I'm like, but not like this. There's mm -hmm. no way that that this, particularly that we can tell this story today. If if California wine just evolved on its own, and oh, we, we sent some to France and people figured it out and we started to drink wine here. And, you know, uh, I think Lyndon Johnson was the first uh, president to serve uh, domestic wine in the in a mm -hmm. state dinner. You know, that, that was 1950, 62 or something. Okay, so this is long before the Church of Paris, and it was at the White House, but no one cared. No one cared then. And so I thanked him for this job, and I thank your father for this job because it's been uh, very rewarding for me. And uh, I hope we get to see you soon. Thank you, Paul. And actually, my father has often told me that the thing that he is most proud of is not the 73 Montalena or the 69 Mondavi Cabernet, but of actually providing employment to almost 50 people and their families. Wow. So that's something that has been very consistent. And uh, in fact, uh, the gentleman that worked for us for a very long time, uh, Gustavo Brambila, started his own wine, um, also figured in the, the movie, uh, he was actually hired after the judgment of Paris. Um, really? but, uh, he was, uh, the, it was a great story with him as well. I know you're trying to wrap up, but his father right. worked, um, at Beaulieu Vineyards, I believe, as a janitor. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, my dad would see him and all of his children, and he took him aside one day and says, you know, the best gift you can give your kids is education. And if you take at least one of your children and send them to school um, so that they can learn winemaking, that would be wonderful. And so he sent his son, Gustavo, who showed up on, you know, Chateau Montalena's doorstep and asked my dad for a job. And so he, uh, he left Montalene and came to work for my dad for many years before going out on his own. So, you know, again, education, and uh, that goes hand in hand with employment, uh, and it's something to be very proud of. So thank you, Paul. It's been you. a wonderful life lessons, and uh, your father is very wise, and he, he's created a lot more than 50 jobs. Yes, he has. Thank yeah. you. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>
Mm-hmm.